Hello, everyone. Welcome. This evening is November 17th, and we're joined by Valentina, who is a building biologist, EMF mitigating expert, home health expert. And I'm very uh, excited to have her here because this is something that I've personally been on a journey for for a while, um, starting with my office. Um, I took a course on how to mitigate EMF. And then throughout this journey, I met Valentina as well, and she came to my home and she measured the EMFs around my home, and we determined that my bedroom is a major source of different sources of EMF, which she's going to explain more about tonight as well. And um, it can be very practical. There's going to be a lot of takeaways that you're going to be able to immediately implement at home. So I'm very excited to have you. Thank you so much for joining us, Valentina. Uh, please take Thank it away. You. Thank you very much. And hi, everyone. I'm also very excited to, to be here and really create awareness um, about EMF, about environmental toxins and toxicity in general. And um, to start, I would like just to give you a little introduction and background of my story. And um, so first of all, I'm an architect and I trained as a, a architect in Italy. And I worked for companies for about um, 10, 12 years. And at some point, there was something that um, wasn't sitting right with me, besides, you know, the uh, unexistent work life balance uh, that, uh, if, you know, there are many other architects, they, they know um, it's a job that is very, very demanding if you work for a company. And uh, beside that, I, really um, started feeling and seeing things that I was wondering, why are we doing this in this way? And for example, I would um, design a beautiful space for a client. And the one that I remember is for um, LinkedIn headquarters and beautiful design, the client is very happy. So we opened the door to show the client the, uh, the, the space, the ready space, because they were traveling from US. And when we open the door and walk in, everything looks beautiful. And then there's this very strong smell of chemicals because all the products of architecture and interiors, they are completely filled with, with chemicals. And um, this was one of the things that started making me think, you know, beside the fact that I don't want to um, design and create smelly spaces, I started wondering, you know, maybe because they're so smelly, they might not be very healthy. <laughs> and And that's how everything started and since then I um, founded my business called Energy in Space uh, about five years ago now yeah it's more than five years and uh, I in the past 10 years I would say I specialized in building biology um, which includes the electromagnetic fields um, I also specialized in ancient sciences, we can call them as classical feng shui and land energy dowsing. Um, and I also um, became recently a part-time professor for a couple of universities here, uh, specialized in wellness design. And um, I am part of the advisory team for the Global Wellness Institute. Um, which is a, a very nice organization worldwide that they uh, provide a lot of uh, information and strategies in the wellness industry for different aspects. So um, this is a very little um, summary of my last 10 years, I would say, but we're going to see in more details um, uh, what exactly I do on a daily basis. So uh, energy and space is uh, my business and what we do simply we want to create environments that are healthy that are conscious um, that really are filled only with natural frequencies as much as possible which means we try to remove any disruptors that um, can really interfere with that having that harmonious harmonious connection with nature um, there are so many frequencies emitted by electromagnetic fields, um, by, you know, chemicals in products, they also come with a frequency and everything depletes the quality of our environment. So we focus on these aspects and we have, um, we use the integrative design model that we have created, um, which is a combination of a 50% ancient sciences 
and 50% contemporary. So what we know as what we what globally we recognize as a as a science. So electromagnetic fields and building um, and building biology. And by using this model, we basically help people creating healthier environment and design new spaces. And we overlay all the layers of study and analysis of our environment to really achieve as much as possible um, spaces that can really support health and well-being. Um, when it comes to um, what we do, we do interior design for commercial homes, um, wellness architecture advisory. Um, we do audit existing spaces. So whether it's a home, a bedroom, an office space, and we identify what could be the trigger of certain illnesses or so certain symptoms for people. Uh, we also help people looking for um, um, for homes, for properties and office spaces uh, and determine, you know, what can be a potential health issues within within a, a property that someone wants to buy or, or rent simply and we do a lot of workshops and education uh, definitely so this is really to give you that um, background because we do a lot of different things and um, it's all really um, the, the passion and the mission is to make people healthy by improving their environment um, what we're talking about today, we're focusing on electromagnetic fields and building biology. Um, so we're talking about the contemporary sciences and how these affects our health and what we can do to um, to improve our our environments, our homes to to feel better, to feel more energized and to um, to have a space that can really support our health and, and healing. So. I'm sure you're all aware that our health is affected by um, different things, um, but one that people generally tend to be less aware of is the actual environment. And by environment, um, I don't mean only um, a city or, you know, the city that you live in, which is also, of course, has an effect, but also the environment, your, your house and what's inside your home or if you spend a lot of time in an office space, what, what happens in that office space? And this is um, a very important aspect because if you focus only, um, um, let's say your energy in terms of improving health, only on the food and the movement and on the emotional aspect as well, which is also very important, uh, and you still live in a toxic environment, it would be really, really hard to, you know, make a lot of progress, or maybe you might make progress and then you'll go back to having similar symptoms or maybe new symptoms. So the environment is really important because um, all the toxins enter our body through three main routes. One is, of course, what we eat, and two are absorption and inhalation. So breathing and absorbing through the skin and the eyes as well. Um, which is really, um, it, it's really interesting to see that and important to determine that the environment actually um, is, you know, giving us toxins through two of three of these, uh, of these uh, ways. Um, so absorption and, and breathing. The breathing is, we breathe every second, we take a breath and we breathe air that, you know, if it's not healthy, it can affect our health. So when it comes to the electromagnetic fields, um, these are part of our environment today. And in the past, I would say five years now, maybe even in the past two, three years, we've seen a major increase in the amount of electromagnetic fields. And these are invisible, so we cannot see them. Uh, we cannot touch them or you know, smell them. Um, and they surround any electrical device. So the problem with today's homes and offices is that now with the increase of technology and the, you know, all connected world, we have so many appliances that the amount of electromagnetic fields have increased really, really um, by big, big numbers in the past years. And this is what it started affecting people. And just to give you a little bit of um, of a understanding background, so generally, 
um, what we there are two types of electromagnetic fields. One type is called ionizing, uh, which is this on the right side of the screen. Um, these are the ones that usually everyone knows. So when we talk about X-ray and gamma ray, uh, these are the very, very strong frequencies that they're so intense, they can actually break our atoms, so they can kill us. So these are also the, you know, um, atomic bombs that they used for, for the wars in the past. And these are very, very dangerous. And they run on very, very high frequencies. And then we have the non-ionizing one, which are all the ones below the green bar. These are um, not um, able to break our atoms, but they're actually able to uh, damage our cells. So they work on a molecular level, not at the atomic level. So they will not kill us on the spot, like the strongest ionizing radiations, but uh, they will start um, breaking and damaging our, our cells. So these include, for example, um, radio frequencies, microwaves, radiations, they're called infrared, and these are emitted by power transmission lines, uh, TV screens, Wi-Fi routers, mobile phones. And basically, the, um, um, the longer the wavelength, uh, the less is the frequency, the lower is the frequency. So when we have very, very uh, short wavelengths, we have much higher frequencies in general. And when it comes to electromagnetic fields, one of the questions that um, I get asked all the time, like, you know, what is EMF? Is this an EMF of type? Is the phone tower EMF? It's a, it can be very confusing. <laughs> so electromagnetic fields in general are, as we've seen, are waves that carry a frequency. There are mainly three types. So one type of EMF is electric fields. These are produced by uh, voltage and uh, they increase as the voltage increases. So for example, um, by anything that is plugged into a wall socket, uh, it will emit some sort of electric fields. They're measured in volts per meter and uh, the symptoms from high exposure to electric fields uh, so it's important to note that we're all born um, in electric fields. So the harmonics of electric fields are all around us because we have electricity. Um, but the levels have always been very, very low. Now, because of the um, increase of appliances and technology, they're increasing as well. So that's why when we have high exposure, we can start feeling symptoms. And the symptoms that are mainly associated with electric fields are insomnia, tiredness, feeling very um, hyperactive as well at the same time while being tired and waking up often at night, for example. And then we have the magnetic fields. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, maybe you've studied at school uh, that every time there is a, a flow of current, there is like a magnetic field around it. So they, if there is a flow of current, there is always a magnetic field. So the magnetic field um, it's also coming from um, electrical devices and motors. They're measured in uh, Gauss or Tesla. And the symptoms of uh, exposure, high exposure of magnetic fields are generally uh, depression, uh, cancer and leukemia and general like heaviness in the body, feeling really, really heavy. Um, the magnetic fields are the probably the most dangerous from an EMF perspective, if we can say that, because high exposure, it's been associated to, um, as you can see, like cancer and leukemia. They've done a lot of studies in schools where they found um, a lot of, uh, they actually did these studies because a lot of kids had leukemia in certain schools, and then they figured it was from high magnetic fields in that specific school. And then um, these electric and magnetic fields, so both together, they are emitted, for example, the, by the power transmission lines that you see around the cities. They're emitted by, <coughs> sorry, um, lamps, generally next to the bed, by integrated lighting um, behind the bed. So this is a very common design for hotels where you will find extremely high electric fields 
even when the lights are actually switched off. Um, because the flow of current, it's uh, even though the lights are off, it's always present. Um, so this is, yeah, a typical room with high electric fields. And then it's emitted by appliances like air purifiers, the humidifiers. So it's it doesn't mean we cannot use them, but we just need to keep them at a distance. Um, so air purifiers, for example, should be kept at least two meters away from the beds. Um, and then, of course, uh, phone chargers, any type of, of chargers are the, the highest. So in general, um, you will find um, electric and magnetic fields, which are called electromagnetic fields together. <clears throat> in this type of every time there is a, a, an electrical appliance. And this yellow tool is um, one of the professional electromagnetic fields meter that is used um, uh, professionally to measure all the fields. And uh, it also can record, actually, um, we can keep the meter for a certain amount of time to record if there is any spike or if there is any anything happening. Because when we measure, we measure what happens on the spot, but then which gives us an idea and an average and a good, very good indication. But when we have clients with severe cases of uh, hypersensitivity, then we need to record. And so this meter is really, uh, really useful. And I actually um, just want to jump in here yeah. and let them know, actually. So Valentina actually did do this in my house because one of the complaints that I had when we moved into this home was that I stopped sleeping, completely stopped sleeping. And I was waking up every night at the same time. So one of the questions that we had was, and Valentina has experienced, experienced this with other clients, where the cell tower was resetting or it was loading up or something like that, right? And, and when that happens, yeah. there's a huge surge. And so when she leaves this overnight, it can actually measure if there are any spikes that happen throughout the night that might be disrupting your sleep from nearby yeah. towers and whatnot. So yeah. it, it definitely does affect, definitely does affect. Yes, and this is exactly um, part of the, you know, the radio frequencies, um, frequencies which are also called microwaves radiations which are the, basically these are electric and magnetic fields together, but they're so intense that you cannot measure them separately. So they are known as microwaves, radiations, or radio frequencies, and they're measured in microwatts per square meters. And this, um, these are emitted by phone towers and wireless connections, and symptoms from high exposures are generally Again, each person can have different symptoms, like for any other, you know, like when we get a flu, when we get a bacteria, we can have similar symptoms from other people, but we might react in different ways. And the same for EMF. Um, the most, um, the symptoms that have been associated to most people are relating to headaches, memory loss, brain fog, the ear ringing is a very common one, tinnitus uh, tin in English. I think, and then palpitations and anxiety. Anxiety is like that when the heart beats fast and you don't know why, that's usually associated to high exposure to this type of uh, radio frequencies. And these again are emitted by, I mean, the phone towers in the cities, baby monitors, um, cordless phones, Wi-Fi routers, and many, many more devices that uh, have either a wireless connection or a, <coughs> sorry, or a Bluetooth uh, connection. Um, and these, like as Bernadette was saying before, these towers, for example, during the nighttime, they um, sometimes they reset. So, because what happens is that during the day with the sun and the atmosphere during the daytime, um, these antennas, they work. At a certain capacity but when the night time comes it's dark so there is no sun and the atmosphere is different um, then they start working on a different in a different capacity so the frequencies might increase or might decrease generally in the night time we have seen that because there is less usage of phones and tvs because people are sleeping 
um, the frequencies are, are reduced in the night time, but then there is a point where some of these antennas, they reset, and that's where they emit a big spike. And that's when we see, um, uh, when it happened with a couple of clients that they would wake up at the same time. And then we found that by recording um, in the night time, exactly at that time, there was a spike of, of radiation, which is insane. Uh, it was so high, it was, extremely high so but again her husband didn't feel that it was only one person out of two using that room so it's uh it's very uh, subjective as well and these are some uh, meters professional meters um see one thing that it's important to mention about the meters is that um generally these are specific for radio frequencies and they measure between um you know um uh, 200 hertz until 8 gigahertz or 10 gigahertz. There is a very wide range. So if you're using, uh, for example, an um, emitter um, that is for home use, just watch what type of frequency it, the meter is actually capturing because it might not be capturing everything. And ideally today, because of the development of the technology and the 5G and the 4G increases, um, we need at least a meter that can measure up to eight gigahertz. That's very important. But anyway, this is what we use professionally. And this antenna is to find the source um, when, you know, there is an environment highly polluted with radio frequencies. We sometimes use this antenna to identify where is it exactly coming from? Where is the strongest source? Because sometimes there is so much and we cannot see everything. Sometimes things are hidden. And when it comes to um, explaining what type of the, what type of effects electromagnetic fields have uh, on our body, so um, these are a series of again uh, symptoms. Uh, one of the main um, two of the main concerns I would say are um, oxidative stress and blood. Uh, the blood that doesn't it clogs it doesn't flow well. So for example, here you see uh, a normal cell and you see a cell that is exposed uh, to EMF. And this is what happens with oxidative stress. The cell becomes really ill. And another example is uh, the blood um, state just without phone, without any electromagnetic fields. And then after one minute, um, you are on the on the phone uh, or you are exposed to electromagnetic fields, um, the blood starts, um, you know, becoming really close together. It doesn't flow, there is a clot. And this is why also heart attacks, the cardiovascular problem are another main issue from, uh, from high EMF exposure because the blood doesn't flow and it causes uh, heart attacks as well. And then you see here that um, recovery. So, it's very important to say that, you know, we can recover and that's why it's important to really manage the exposure to EMF on a daily basis because the effects of EMF are cumulative. So if you're always exposed to high EMF, you are in this state all the time. Your blood is constantly under stress. Um, if you at least, you know, during the day, it's hard to control because we go out and we go in different places, but at least in your house, when you're home and at the nighttime in your bedroom, uh, if you're able to control, you're, give, you're giving your body the chance to recover and to let your body to flow better and cells to be less under, under stress. Um, also recognized by the World Health Organization, um, as EMF has been have been classified as uh, carcinogenic in the group 2B. Um, so this means that they've done tests on animals, not on humans. So uh, they've done uh, tests on rats and other animals. And this is, um, I mean, group 2B, for example, there is asphalt in the same category. There is, I think, diesel fuel from that we use for the cars. So Obviously, like we don't expose ourselves to, um, um, you know, we don't surround ourselves with fuel. We use it for our cars, 
And the same way we shouldn't be have a high exposure to EMF in the same way we don't want to smell fuel every day in our houses. Um, this is another, well, there is also a lot of a lot of scientific papers and research. There are some references at the end that you can check because there's a lot of studies um, on environmental medicine about EMF and um, it's the issues that it's such a big, um, you know, economy when it comes to the telecommunication industry that most of the studies that are sponsored by the telecommunication industry, mm -hmm. then they eventually don't have enough proof. They say that this can be harmful, while independent studies from scientists and doctors worldwide, they have a lot of proof that actually we need to start mitigating this. So this is an example of how a mobile phone radiation penetrates the brain. Um, so you see that a five years old, because the brain is softer, there is more penetration of these waves and for an adult is less. Um, but anyway, no one should really keep the phone on the, on the ear um, because you can see that they keep going inside, especially the Bluetooth headsets and all of these. Yeah. Um, and in a general bedroom, what to look for, like, because ideally, um, at least, at least our bedroom in our home should be completely EMF free or as low as it possibly can be um, so that we can recover. So in your bedroom, for example, um, you can um, possible exposures are again, electric fields from bedside table lamps. So uh, this, you can just switch them off or unplug them. Um, also electric circuits that run behind the headboards um, can also have electric and magnetic fields emitting. So that's why when we design um, a home, for example, we would never run wiring behind the bed for this reason. Um, you could have, for example, radio frequencies from outdoor phone towers. Or nowadays, because of the amount of uh, Wi-Fi and cameras that people have in their homes, you might even get signals from neighbors. I mean, definitely for an apartment, and um, for for villas as well, it can happen. Uh, a lot of people are putting Wi-Fi routers in their gardens to even outside to support their CCTV system. So then the neighbors in villas, they end up with signals and we cannot see everything. Not all of these are visible, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and then also there is, um, for example, some, furniture like mattresses with uh, metal springs are not ideal because metal conducts electricity, so electric fields. So what happens is when you have mattresses with metal, you will create a static electric field, which means um, there is a bit of energy uh, running under you while you're sleeping and that interferes with the earth natural electromagnetic fields <laughs> because it's uh, it's right below you and it's really not not recommended, not healthy. Sorry, one second. I think um <coughs> my throat is dry because I'm speaking too much. So if you have any questions. <laughs> it's okay. I actually I'll I'll jump in here. I'll give you I'll give your throat a break. Um when you actually you know measured everything in my room, how you were mentioning how there could be circuits behind certain walls. For me in my bedroom, there was actually, it was actually coming from an underground water line, right? There was, there was mm -hmm. that field that was coming out plus the cell tower. And so Valentina, uh, the solution, obviously, I mean, I can't go anywhere. We just moved into this house. The solution was to rearrange my bedroom completely. So the design and the decor of how my bedroom was originally set up, she completely moved it, transformed it in another way. So I can move away from the water line that was directly interestingly enough I was the one being disturbed in my sleep and it was right under my side of the bed my husband wasn't as affected <laughs> and then when we yeah. moved the bed to a different position different space of the room and also you mentioned that there might be things behind the wall moving the bed away from the wall right at least yeah. a foot two feet away <laughs> yeah just creating distance can also make a difference you know so just 
moving your bed around in the room, moving it away from walls, unplugging outlets, all of those little small things can really add up and make a big difference in terms of quality of sleep, which is the most yeah. foundational aspect to help. It's where we repair and regenerate. Yeah, absolutely. Um, small changes can make a big difference. <clears throat> So some um, strategies on what you can do in your house. So the most important thing is to minimize the wireless technology and the amount of appliances you have. Um, <laughs> there is a lot of, um, there is a big trend of smart homes and many people love it. They want everything connected, uh, doing everything with the phone, but that is really, um, really, um, crazy because you get very very heavy polluted homes um sorry i'm having this i would say i don't know how smart it is to have a smart home <laughs> it's not very smart no. <laughs> definitely um and the the levels of frequencies i can tell you when i measure these smart homes and then i tell people like i mean you have about a hundred thousand microwatts per square meters in your environment in your house the safe levels in the bedroom should be ideally below 10 or maximum 100 and no wonder people are not feeling great but anyway um so eliminate as much as possible create distance and decrease the time of exposure these are the most important thing when it comes to the bedroom um ideally again um do not keep the phone. I always tell my client just to make a habit of, you know, create a charging station in your house. Um, before you go to sleep, charge your phone, leave it outside your room and then go to bed. And you can put it on airplane mode as well. Uh, but the problem is that if you charge it next to the bed, this charger emits very high electric fields. So ideally, no appliances, nothing connected into, into the bedroom. Um, all the switches, or if you live in, in UAE, we have switches at the power socket, so it's very easy to turn them off. So even this table lamp, it's not just switching this off, but you'll have to turn off at the power switch or unplug it because otherwise it's still emitting electric fields and each lamp is different. Some they emit, um, few volts per meters, either they emit like 100 volts per meter. Um, it's really impossible to tell unless you you measure it, unfortunately. Um, and uh, definitely um, when it comes to, you know, Wi-Fi connection, Bluetooth, if you have Wi-Fi in the house, um, you can either turn it off or shield it. The thing with Wi-Fi routers is that the way they're built, if you turn them on and off um, every day, they might become slow. So when you wake up in the morning and you turn it on, you might have to wait long or it gets stuck and then you have to go back to fix it. So um, it really depends on how is your routine. So for example, if um, you're a type of family that you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is you turn on your Wi-Fi because you need it immediately for some for whatever reasons, then I would suggest that you use a shield and you can get a Faraday cage. And just before you sleep, you put the, far the router inside the Faraday cage so you don't switch it off, but you completely shield it basically. If your habits as a family is that you wake up and you don't really care about the Wi-Fi because maybe you go to school, you leave the house and you go outside, then you can just switch it on and off. And whenever it breaks, you just change it. <laughs> It's just you know what to do. Um, it really depends on the on the habits of the of the family. Um, ideally, you want to wire your 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 connection and wire um, using the old Ethernet cable connection. Um, it's not as simple for many families because there is nowadays all the homeworks are on these iPads and uh, it's it's very hard to manage but again if you have a house that you know also um, um, 
maybe even if you rent it, you can do it. Like you can create really, it's just about building habits and then everything is possible to, to achieve. So in the bedroom, um, again, ideally no metal in the bedroom, whether it's for the bed or the mattress, because they conduct electricity. I've had a lot of clients that sleep on a, on a metal bed. So it's actually a, a bed frame made of metal, just because of the design of it. They like it. And that's really not, it, it conducts a lot of electricity around. Um, and then again, appliances, if you have air purifiers, which are also good to have, especially in Dubai. Um, ideally, yeah, two, three meters away from the bed because they have a motor and they emit high electromagnetic fields. So this is for the for the bedroom. And um, this is an example of um, airplane mode. Um, if you put your phone on airplane mode before sleeping, just make sure that you have Wi-Fi off, Bluetooth, everything off here, but then you have to click on each, open and make sure that the Bluetooth is actually off because sometimes what happens is the Bluetooth uh, is, says it's off here, but then when you open it, it's actually on. And then you also have Wi-Fi calling. So when you open the Wi-Fi and the mobile data, you will see that um, you need to have everything off here as well. And again, opening Wi-Fi calling, again, make sure it's off. Um, I don't know why phones are done in this way, but most of the times when I go do um, an EMF inspection and I ask people to uh, put the phone on the airplane mode, they do it. And then with my meters, I can still see that it's actually <laughs> not on airplane mode. And I tell them, can I please check? And, and they get almost offended, but I just mm -hmm. put on airplane mode. <laughs> You're ch it's true. It's true. Because normally yeah. I just do it from my screen, you know, like you just swipe it down. I know you have to go it's in. Off. Yeah. Like my Bluetooth is off right now. But when I actually go into settings and I click Bluetooth. Yeah. It's yeah. Sneaky. It's on. Mm. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. It's it's... Even though it was off. Yeah. Okay. Thank so... you for that tip. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, it's very, very tricky, especially that they keep releasing new phones. And so you need yeah. to keep checking. This is I just an you. iPhone. Um, but this is important because it, it really makes a difference because even if you have one of these on, it will be emitting like a router next to you. So this is important. And this is an example of a battery operated clock. I don't know if... Um, I mean, um, some people don't even remember them because they were used so long time ago, but they <laughs> actually still exist. You can get them on Amazon. And and this is an example of um, a shielding net for the Wi-Fi or a Faraday cage that you can find in this website. When By the way, I bought my daughter a beautiful battery operated clock from Pottery Barn. If anybody's ah, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, they're they're great. I mean, we don't need um, anything else, I think, in the bedroom. When it comes to the office, so if you, I mean, obviously, if you work in an office with many people with the company, it's very hard to control, um, very hard. But if you have a home office or you work alone with one or two, three people, then super easy. Because the um, what's really... Um, <clears throat> Important is to also understand that in an office space, we can be exposed to so many frequencies. And if we accumulate them for eight hours a day or six or 10, then it can still affect our sleep, even if our bedroom is completely MF free. So what you collect during the day is also important. So for the office, in case you are very close to a router, um, I mean, Beside, of course, wiring your internet connection, which would be the easiest thing to do, especially if you if you work from the same desk every day and you have a computer, a desktop. Um, beside that, the second thing you can do is move the router as um, as far as possible, and uh, or shield it at least. You can shield it with a net that will reduce the radiation and still leave a bit of signal. Did someone raise a hand or? Yes, yeah, safe, safe, go ahead. 
Uh, hi, Bernadette. Thank you so much, Valentina, for uh, hi. for this presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, for so I just want. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to ask. Uh, so, like, if do I have to unplug the device totally, so I cannot just switch it off? So I literally Which before, one? Uh, like the printer, like uh, uh, microwave, like TV, like ah, uh, if it's a yeah, yeah. Well, so. For example, um, when it comes to the office space, the printer, yeah, you just switch it off at the power outlet. So if it's just off with the power button of the appliance, it's not actually off. It's still emitting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so that applies to all electrical devices. Yes, all of them. All okay. of them, yes. Um, but for example, for the TV, it's a tricky one because... The TV also, if you keep switching on and off, it you know the technology doesn't support that. So I, ideally, I mean, depend on on how is your house. But if you have, if you sleep in a bed and you have a TV on the opposite wall, for example, okay. because you have a living room on the other side of the wall, that's really not ideal. So that I would recommend to wire the TV instead of switching okay. on and off because it's very easy to wire. You just get these cables ethernet connection from amazon and then you can okay. either acti activate with your app um from door etisala to the data point of the tv or you just call them in to activate um okay because this will give internet to the tv and even if you keep it on it will not emit radio frequencies on the other side and generally the electric fields are not high from what i've measured on the other side of the wall so you can actually keep it on. I mean, switch with the power switch on. And safe in terms of the printer, I mean, I hardwired it completely in my office, my keyboard, okay. my laptop. I have I bought a Cat7 Ethernet cable okay. and even my printer. Everything is hardwired. So I've got many USB jacks on my PC and I just hardwire everything. So that so now you don't have to unplug it. You just switch it off, and that's it. So, so, I mean, for me, my printer is far away, so I don't okay. um, I'm I don't switch it off at the at the wall. Ideally, that's what you should do is at the wall itself because there's still okay. electrical. Um, yeah, if it's closed, frequency. yeah. But if you're if your distance, if you're far enough away from it, there's less. Like I physically measured it. And usually about a when I'm about a feet, two feet away from my electrical outlets from the walls, I'm okay in terms of the electrical frequency. So if the printer isn't okay. too, too close for you, you know, it should be okay. Okay, that's great. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. So if you have a lot of, I mean, ideally. Because a lot of people, they keep their phones on their desk charging, their iPads charging, and then maybe they have a cordless phone, and then they have a printer, they have a Wi-Fi router, um, they have, I don't know, maybe other appliances, air purifiers. Mouse. Well, yeah, the keyboards, yeah, true, the mouse, all of this. Um, so ideally... Um, um, yeah, just try to minimize and keep everything as far as possible. That's the, the ideal thing. And yeah, if you don't use the printer continuously, you can just keep it off and turn it on when, when it's needed, for example, if it's close to you. Um, and then an important thing as well that really helps is to make sure that all the electrical devices are actually grounded. So this is an example of a grounded socket. Um, this means that this third pin it's the it's the grounding it's the earthing so the current goes to the ground <laughs> if you have these two pins one this is not grounded so the electric fields they don't go to the ground but they stay in the air so you will you will have much higher electric fields from these type of um sockets than the grounded ones <laughs> so this is very um important mm. and then um also the power strip, there is in the offices, there is uh, usually people have a lot of power strips because they have a lot of stuff plugged in. Using the power strip um, 
also uh, emits a very high electric field. So if you have it, just make sure you keep it as far as possible from your feet um, or from your um, from your body, from your yeah, from you in general, even the feet. So if it's on the ground, it should be as far as possible. Uh, again, ideally two meters, it's really the ideal uh, scenario. And then if you have earthing mats, uh, they're good to use um, to use on your feet. Like as you basically work, you keep the earthing mat below your feet, but only if you have a very low electromagnetic fields environment, um, because otherwise it becomes too heavy and your body keeps conducting uh, electric fields like an antenna. So you don't want to have a high EMF environment and using earthing mats. Yeah. Um, so then from outside sources, so this is what you can do in your house. Now, from outside, um, the main issues are the send cell phone towers, I would say, and um, or the neighbors. So if there is something coming from outside that is not in your control, um, first of all, there is you can check this article about phone towers distance because one of the questions that I get asked the most is what is a safe distance from a, a phone tower, like a cell phone tower? And the answer is uh, there is no safe distance because you always have to measure because there are many antennas that are not visible or there are maybe um, phone towers that are far away, but the beam of one of these antennas is right hitting your window of your bedroom, for example. And we cannot know unless we measure because this phone, these antennas, you see each of these antennas have a beam signal and um, it really emits um, very far, you know, up to one kilometer. And <coughs> um, you never know where it's pointing, even if this antenna is facing this direction, inside the antennas might be directed towards the right or the left, we don't know. So. Um, in this article, you can check it. There is much more details about this. It was a very common question, and it's very, very hard for me to uh, <laughs> to answer because the only thing we can do is to measure what happens. Mm -hmm. A lot of these frequencies also they bounce, they bounce off glass, they bounce off walls, so you never know what's coming in. Oh, wow. And when it comes to um, what to, you can do from outside sources. There are shielding curtains, there are shielding canopies that are made of uh, copper and silver threads uh, wrapped in cotton. So they're actually quite soft. They're not <laughs> too bad. Um, and then you have also shielding paint and shielding glass film for the, for the windows. Now, what I always say is um, it's, it's important, like, you know, do not shield your bedroom just for the sake of just for prevention, because um, first of all, it's, um, you know, it's um, these items are not extremely expensive, but they are a cost. So to shield a room, I would say uh, with paint and glass fill, maybe you need about a thousand, two thousand dollars, depending on the size of the of the room. Um, and sometimes you know, depending on the level of the frequencies, then <clears throat> you might find that, oh, if you only do this on this wall, it, it will work. So you might not need to shield the whole room. Or if the levels are not as high, you could use just the curtains or, or the canopy, for example. Mm -hmm. If the levels are very, very high, then you need two, three coats of this paint, even on the ceiling and the glass film. So it really depends on what are the levels, what are the sources. And so, uh, and also if you shield a room, it's not recommended that then you have Wi-Fi router inside that room or Bluetooth items because these frequencies will bounce inside the room. <laughs> uh, so it, it will make the, the room even higher um, from an electromagnetic field. But this is just to mention there are some um, EMF shielding products available in the market. 
And then um, I think this is the last slide about the EMF in specific, just harmonizers, because this is something that I get asked all the time. I get so many messages of people telling me, oh, look, I found this uh, EMF harmonizers um, and it's only a pendant. It's not too expensive. And I'm like, OK, this is not these yeah. these do not actually reduce electromagnetic fields. Um, and these, uh, there are so many types. I just picked this, and again, maybe I shouldn't put the name of the company, but um, there are millions of these in the market. And I just want to say we're not against it. We just um, need to tell people that these do not reduce the levels of the radiation. So my meters would have exactly the same numbers if you're wearing these or you're having these pyramids. And um, and the ideal thing is to have a low EMF room or house. And then, I mean, you can get whatever harmonizers you like. If you feel you resonate with some of these because of whatever reasons, I don't say they don't work on another level, but on an EMF level, they do not reduce the radiations. Yeah. I say when I, I'm always getting asked also about different, there's so many different products on the market right yeah. now. Yeah. And, and I, they're so my, good with their marketing. Yeah, and my reply <laughs> I is, would buy them. They they give you a false sense of security. That's what it yes. does. Um, yeah. There's actual real valid ways like what you've just shared in terms of unplugging things, wiring things, distancing from things. Um, yeah. That's true mitigation. Wearing a device that supposedly absorbs <laughs> yeah. a false sense of security. There's a lot more tangible ways to actually mitigate EMFs. Yeah, and um, here there is an article uh, that I wrote about this. Um, so usually whoever asks me, I send them this link <laughs> because it's, it's quite like, it's important to explain it properly because it's not like a, a two words conversation. Yeah. Um, so this is useful if you're interested to read. It explains everything and and the whys. And but yeah, in a nutshell, they don't really reduce the radiations. Um, and yeah, but these are just some of them. Um, is there any uh, questions about the EMF before maybe we go into the um, other part of the presentation? Hi. Thank you, Valentina. Hi. That's, I have a, a few questions, actually. Yeah. I would like to what you think of the solar panels. Is yes. Is there uh, coming from them, especially if you're uh, living on the last, last floor? And they're yeah. Just, and what do you think of electric cars? <laughs> yeah, OK. So the solar panels, um, solar panels, so yeah it's a bit complex basically um the issue uh with solar panels and emf is the actual inverter of um of the solar panel system so the solar panels what they do they collect dc electricity which is direct current from the sun and then they take it and they invert it into ac <laughs> alternate current um electricity that process of inversion, it creates very high electric and magnetic fields. Mm -hmm. So if your inverter is nearby living areas or bedrooms, yeah, that's absolutely not ideal. And second, there are some solar panels that they have inverters within each panel. So it would depend what type of solar panel system you have. And also that's not ideal if they are exactly on top, on top of you. Um, for example, so it depends on the type of uh, of uh, technology and where things are located. Um, when it comes to electric car, um, electric cars are absolutely fine when you drive them because basically they're on a battery. So when you drive them, you drive them on a battery that has been charged. But if you have a charger um, in your house, in your garage, that is attached on a wall of a of a bedroom or a living space while you charge the car and i assume most people would charge it at night because they use it in the daytime <laughs> that's where you get very high electromagnetic fields 
But if the garage and the charger is far away, um, you know, at least you know, I would say four or five meters, it's not a concern. Wow, thank you. The problem is I often do, I often turn the Wi-Fi at night, but even when I turn it off, I can kill, still catch the signals from the neighbors. Um, yeah, yeah. I that can't. Which is the problem. And could you tell us more about the um, the hardwire? How to hardwire a printer or or a TV? I didn't really understand. Um, that. Oh yeah, yeah. That's um, so basically to hardwire. This is a cable uh, a cable for hardwiring. So basically, each um, TV has um, has um, basically the um, the connection for these. So in, and in your house, you will have a data point, it's called, which is, um, it looks like a power socket, but it's not a power socket. It has like a, a square outlet. <laughs> and basically, um, you just need to get these um, off, um, off Amazon, for example, or any shop. Um, and then uh, call Do or Etisalat to come in and activate that data point that you need to connect. So then your TV will be connected to the, <coughs> sorry, to the Ethernet instead of the uh, the wireless connection. Or for your laptop, for example, I don't know if I have, um, I think that there was a slide. Oh, there was no slide here, but there are also actually, <coughs> if you, for example, next to your bed, you have a data point for sure. Generally, in all houses, there is a data point. So you put that Ethernet cable and then you buy an adapter that will allow you to connect the Ethernet cable to the phone, to whatever phone you have. So if you have an iPhone or Samsung or any other, there are adapters for each phone. So then you put your phone on airplane mode and you can use um, Internet through the cable, which doesn't emit anything. Um, instead of using the, the wireless. And that is applicable to iPads and um, um, Valentino, computers. Would, would yes. you be able to share um, the adapters and the links to these things uh, mm. with us so that I can make it available? Uh, yeah, of course. We're going to have this presentation to share with members. And then what we can do is also take links, anything that you have, and we could link people to it. And Raya, by the way, I have a highlight on Instagram. Um, I think it's called EMF, EMF highlight, where I actually linked, um, I believe, the Cat7 Ethernet cable that I yeah. use to hardwire my laptop um, and my office. It's, it's, it's there as well. So you can get, grab the link as well. And, and um, Valentina, if you have anything like what you just said, you said there's an adapter and the cable for phone yeah. use, or iPad use. I'm interested in that actually for my kids, you know, because they, they yeah. have to do their homework on iPads. So I would love to hardwire that if possible. Yeah, I will send you uh, all the links and all the, um, all the information um, for that. Yeah, absolutely. Raya, did that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. And I saw your post. Thank you. Okay, great. Check it out again. Thanks. Okay. So starting with the, uh, I'll start with the second part, which is about um, really like just being aware and understanding what other uh, toxins are we exposed to? Um, so building biology is a science that studies health effects of the built environment on, on humans. And buildings are considered actually as living organism. And nature is what is the golden standard for, for buildings. And the home is seen as our third skin. It's our third layer of protection. Um, you know, we have our 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 skin, we have our clothes, and the third thing is our house that can really protect us. We feel safe. We need to feel safe at home. And then, of course, we have our um, our community, and we have the the earth. So this is how we see uh, in general 
uh, in building biology. And we can see like uh, an association between um, food and buildings. What's been happening in, uh, you know, now since many years is that everything has become very, very junky. So you can see these two images and um, these two images, what they have in common are actually the, uh, the ingredients somehow, because this food um, is full of, you know, preservatives, chemicals and, and toxins that, that it's made of to last forever and to be also addictive, <laughs> probably. Mm -hmm. Um, and our homes are exactly made of similar uh, chemicals and toxins. And the problem is that while we eat this type of food, at the same time, we are breathing and we are inside homes that are also highly, um, highly toxic. <laughs> if we had to put a label on the house, 90% uh, of the ingredients are artificials, are chemicals and are processed. So there is very little left um, about nature in our homes nowadays. And this is an example of how um, ideally, for example, this graph is the ideal architecture for a hot, humid uh, climate, which is what we have in Dubai. So architecture and buildings should adapt to our climate and to the environment we live in. So in this case, this house is raised from the ground to allow ventilation. There is cross ventilation. There is a roof um, that allows the hot air to go up and then to escape. And anyway, I'm not going to go into these details because it's a bit technical, but it's just to explain that the problem today is that our house all look like this. They're made of concrete blocks and it's just a concrete block with a couple of windows. So it's a complete disconnection from nature, from the environment, and it doesn't support at all our health, unfortunately, this type of uh, construction. <laughs> and then, you know, we wonder why um, we get sick all the time. Uh, kids often have asthma, allergies, eczemas, or more and more. Unfortunately, because when we build a house, people actually are wearing these type of suits and masks to protect themselves while they're spraying and uh, using building products to build houses. So this is exactly what happens. So all the poison stays within the walls. So these type of um, chemical soups in our houses, they basically create what is known as environmental illness, <clears throat> sick building syndrome, um, these are illnesses that are triggered or caused by uh, toxins in the environment. So either to high exposures to certain toxins um, or, for example, in building where there is more than 20% uh, of people um, that get sick, um, it means that the building is sick and that's called the sick building syndrome. And all of these environmental illness can lead to uh, multiple chemical sensitivity and um, also electromagnetic fields hypersensitivity because once you uh, trigger something and then you keep expose yourself to it then uh, your body can go into a, a multiple chemical sensitivity where you start getting really sick from um, many of the chemicals in the air or electromagnetic fields for example um, yeah so this is um this is about, you know, our houses, uh, I call them chemical soups because <laughs> we are completely immersed in, in unfortunately, very unhealthy indoor air quality. And that's because in the construction industry, there are about 86,000 chemicals, hmm. uh, even more probably. Um, so, and this has been happening since the... I would say the the word wars, the end of the wars, where all the chemicals that were used for for um, guns and war machines, they've been then used for homes. To mm -hmm. to basically there was a necessity for homes, and uh, there was a lot of companies with no more jobs and works because the work was finished, and all these chemicals were put inside the houses. So this is just to give you a bit of a of a background and. It, nature uses only 12 elements on the periodic table, um, but this is how much 
we use um, in general in the construction industry and, and worldwide as well. So we have created so, so much more. And what happens is when you have a lot of um, chemicals in the air and a lot of, of gassing from furniture and, and houses in general, is that the air is depleted. So what it means is that our air is made of negative and positive ions. And the ideal thing is to have a balance of these two. But when there is a lot of synthetic materials, um, you see that the negative ions immediately uh, get depleted. They disappear in about one hour. And then the air is filled with positive ions. This is where you feel that the air is very electric. So I don't know if you've ever been into one of these bouncy castles for kids. <laughs> They're so electric. <laughs> And, yeah, your hair goes like this. <laughs> yeah, and that's because it's a high synthetic material. And obviously that's an extreme situation, but um, yeah, I happened to to go to um, a bubble hotel, something. Unfortunately, uh, there was a plastic um, dome and the air was terrible. It was all electric. Um, but this is just an extreme, but this is what happens in our houses. We have very electric air, so we attract dust, we attract bacteria, and, and more and more. So what can we do now, I mean, to manage 86, 80,000 chemicals in the construction industry and interiors, it's absolutely impossible at this stage. So um, what I follow is the six classes approach that we use for our projects and our clients to help them navigate this craziness. Um, this is created by environmental health scientists and um, they've classified um, six classes for chemicals as a precautionary principle. And this is used actually by IKEA and Crate and Barrel, which I thought would be useful to know because mm -hmm. every time like clients ask me what furniture brands are good, I tell them IKEA and they're not happy because IKEA looks, uh, you know, it's seen as a bit maybe cheap, <laughs> but actually is the one with the highest standard <laughs> for health. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Crate and Barrel also, but Crate and Barrel is like the opposite, it's quite expensive. So it's... <laughs> And not all their products are certified and so on. But anyway, so to give you some um, some ideas and some um, some tips as well. So the highly um, fluorinated chemicals um, they're usually used to repel stain, oils, water. So these you can find them, you know, furniture <laughs> adhesive. Um, to glue flooring and tiles, for example, carpet cleaning, carpets, um, non-stick uh, pans and pots for cooking. And these are linked to, for example, um, some cancer, kidney and testicular, elevated cholesterol, fertility issues, thyroid problems, obesity. They're found generally in water and dust and they're found in um, our blood. And um, in general, if you avoid um, products with fluorinated PFO and PFOs, PFCS, this usually um, helps. Um, so this is how you can uh, you can avoid them. And this is really um, it's really important also just to mention that because it can be quite overwhelming to you know, understand how many chemicals are around us and we breathe in every day. Uh, but the important thing is to understand that each of us react in a different way. So when we work with a client, we always ask for, the, you know, for their health history, if they have any health issues, any symptoms or anything, or if they are doing any therapy with doctors. And um, because, it's, it's really important to understand because of the amount of chemicals present um, in the construction industry and our interiors, it's uh, if you want to avoid everything, um, it, is, it is possible, um, but 
it comes also with a with a higher budget, I would say. So what we do is we try to understand what is the family or the client health to then, depending on the work that we do for them, understand, okay, maybe we can focus the budget on these specific uh, products because, um, I don't know, they have anxiety, they need uh, probably, you know, if they have high EMF, we need to shield because they have this, I don't know, heart, uh, high heart rates, or if they have fertility problems, we would look into avoiding specific chemicals in their home. So um, it's it's all about, you know, finding the right approach for the right person. And everything is, is possible. Antimicrobials, I mean, um, I'm sure you know from, you know, all the other products for interior products, they are everywhere. <laughs> Um, they use obviously to kill bacteria, they kill the good ones too, not only the bad ones, and then they completely disrupt <coughs> the microbiome of the home because they keep killing all the bacteria. Um, so these are associated with um, disruption, disrupting our hormones, um, <laughs> allergen sensitivities, uh, some of them are associated with asthma, skin irritation, respiratory issues and antibiotic resistance, there is a lot of these. Um, they're found uh, also in water, air, and dust. Uh, they attach to dust, all of these particles. And again, they've been found in human blood and, and breast milk. Ideally, you want to avoid any product that has written antimicrobial. Um, so whether it's an exercise mat, paints for the house, these rubber flooring for kids are the worst thing. Um, I know that they're good because, you know, our flooring is hard and there may be ceramics or marble. We don't have much wood in Dubai, which makes sense not to have because it's not a country where you want to put wooden flooring. But I mean, it's possible. But um, anyway, and so we tend to use for kids this rubber um, rubber floorings to make them play in a soft area. And yeah. It's um, they are usually filled with antimicrobials uh, and fire retardants and much more. So I always recommend just not to use them and find other ways like blankets or any um, natural rugs. Also rugs, they um, get a lot of dust, but if you clean them regularly and they're natural, at least you minimize that. It's much better than a rubber mat for kids. Um, so this is, uh, and definitely avoid fragrances um, because these also are filled with my antimicrobials. Um, another uh, part is another class is the flame retardants. And these are used to prevent um, fire when there is a fire. But the issues that this, they've been testing and they've been um, proven that when there is a fire, and a couch, for example, has um, fire retardants. Um, the delay of the couch to actually pick up the fire is only by a few seconds. So it wouldn't even make a big difference um, for that. And what it does, it actually creates a much, much more worse toxic air for the firemen that are working inside the, the building. So they create a lot of much more toxins that will really put at risk their life even more. So now they have been, they are being removed from a lot of products, luckily. Um, and there was a new um, act in 2013 and then 15. So if you uh, look for these labels, especially for American products, because this is mainly for American products, um, this will tell you that does not have flame retardants. IKEA mattresses do not have flame retardants, for example. Does, uh, so, does IKEA does IKEA's mattresses do they have any without metal? As you were mentioning that we should avoid metal spring beds. Yeah, or, uh, they have a, they have a foam. They have a <laughs> foam one. Uh, they have the foam. The foam doesn't have fire retardants. But then, I mean, if you want to look then into the foam, there will be other chemicals used. <laughs> But again, we need to, I think, you know, we need to choose what. Yeah, pick your battles. Maybe. Yeah, it's like with food. It's the same approach. Like when I go to the supermarket, I get, I, like, I get so depressed because <laughs> certain 
looking at all the ingredients and you know not everything is listed anyway but and I'm not an expert in food and nutrition anyway and I try to buy as natural as possible as organic as possible but we all know you you need to pick your battles even at the supermarket yeah and unless you you have the time to cook all the time and or you have a private chef then it's you know it's really hard <laughs> Uh, but it is possible to improve your, you know, your food. But it's the same with this type of products. You need to pick and choose, you know, among everything what you want to uh, prioritize, depending on your on your needs and on your health as well. So, um, yeah, they at some point in the history, not long ago, they used to use fire retardants even in kids' pajamas. I mean, that which is absolutely insane. So they they actually sell and market uh, pyjamas for kids with fire retardants because they're safer, you know, in case there is a fire, um, which is crazy. Um, then we have this class. Uh, these are used to make plastic harder and stronger. So we all know that ideally we should avoid plastic. It's basically Im impossible to fully avoid it. Um, but if you avoid uh, these codes, this is already helped because, see, it's very good to recycle plastic and recycle everything so we don't keep creating waste in the world. But then when we recycle something, we need to add a lot of chemicals to be able to recycle that product. So that in increases the amount of, um, of, um, of, of chemicals and, and bisphenols that are not healthy at all and they also affect thyroid <coughs> and metabolic functions and neurologicals um these are found i mean in construction pipes um where our water runs in for example that's why also water filtration is ideal um flooring uh, adhesives and glues like now for for a, a project we're looking for a healthier glue for the construction and um, they're available they're just not available in Dubai so we're getting them to come over but it's it's a long um, long process and uh, to go through all the because when they don't have a chemical there is another one coming in so we need to understand what that does solvents you know that smell when you paint your house or you go into a space that's just been painted this is solvents is the smell of solvents or the smell of a new car is solvents. And um, these are in all oil-based products. So anything uh, that is oil-based will have solvents because they need them to bind everything together. Um, ideally, um, um, you know, yeah, these are, are everywhere, adhesive in sealants, household cleaners, even everywhere in paint. So if you use water-based paint, natural paints, um, um, or you select products with a safer choice label um, that really helps. Um, it's much, much healthier than anything with these solvents. That's a brand that's found on, on products or like a logo? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a logo. It just says safer choice. Okay. Uh, for example, it's an echo, one of the echo labeled um, for cleaning products. But I mean, again, for cleaning products, ideally, you know, it should be completely natural. Vinegar, um, vinegar and baking soda. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But a lot of people are, I mean, some, a lot. I mean, I meet a lot, but I don't know if it's because I work a lot with uh, very sensitive people. <laughs> um, but a lot of people are also sensitive to the vinegar smell. Like other people are sensitive to the, um, uh, um, oh my gosh essential oils <laughs> yeah. I couldn't find the word essential oils so it's about what you can uh, what your family can handle in terms yeah. of smells because the vinegar is quite it can be quite strong I don't mind it I drink vinegar um, it's very good to I mean I guess I, I heard it's good to drink vinegar so I do that <laughs> but it's uh, yeah it's uh, quite strong not everyone likes it and then the last the last class is metals I mean, metals have been used for years in the construction industry. Now they are being phased out. 
but because of the high usage, they're now found in air, soil, fish, and food everywhere because everything has been contaminated already. So these are the main ones, mercury, arsenic, chromium, um, emitted by coal burning plants. Um, also in pre-treated wood for construction. So if you have wood in your house or you're planning to get some wooden items, just ask, was it pre-treated where and where does it come from? Um, chromium is used in fertilizers, so in gardens. Um, and um, generally the metals are also found in fake grass. And when that is, you know, hit up by the sun every day, it keeps releasing. So you're in your garden breathing uh, metal. So you just need to- you know to, which uh, ones? Well, all the ones that are uh, done by, made by recycled rubber tires. And generally like with fake grass, um, most of them are really not, um, not great. But again, I think depending where you live, <laughs> Um, in countries like Dubai, it's not ideal to have, um, I mean, real grass because of the amount of water yeah. that it consumes and it dies, it doesn't last, it's it's a lot of maintenance. Um, but um, there's a lot of fake grass in the market. The, see, the thing is with, with, the, um, with the fake grass, uh, the one that I recommend is one from Netherlands. I can send you that as well in a link sure. because maybe it's something that is useful for people in Dubai because it's uh, many people have gardens with fake grass. Um, but the thing is that, you know, talking about the certifications of, um, of products, we'll go through how this can be done, but it's quite, it's, it takes a lot of time for, to assess a product. So I get often like uh, messages from clients or <laughs> emails or Instagram messages like, oh, what do you think about this? I just found this product, if like a fake grass or a air purifier or anything. And, you know, the marketing looks amazing. It's, they say healthy, non-toxic, whatever. But then there is so many things that, you know, I need to check to be able to identify if it's actually <laughs> good. Um and this is an example. So when it comes to certification, so how can you navigate that by yourself? Um, the first question is when you want to buy a product for your house, does the product has any certification? That's the first thing to check. Um, and what is, uh, well, yeah, sorry. The first point is that each product has a different certification, which is very important. So there is not such a certification that certifies overall that will tell you, ah, oh, this product is actually healthy, is non-toxic and is natural. There is no such a thing because each product can be certified by, the, by specific certifications. Then if it's certified by what, what type of certification? And then that specific certifications that this product has, what are the chemicals that they're actually testing for and they're certifying for? Because some certifications might be good for VOCs, volatile organic compounds, but then they will have, for example, fire retardants. Um, what are the ingredients of these products? And are they fully disclosed? Because there is something called the Trade Secret Act, which is an act that allows manufacturers not to disclose 100% of their products if they're inactive. So they're not active, it means inactive. It means that they are used as a carrier of the chemicals inside so that they kind of bind everything together. Um, so it's important that all the ingredients are fully disclosed, ideally. Nowadays, there is much more transparency for manufacturers, so it's a bit easier, uh, but mostly they do not disclose everything. And then the safety data sheet is the last step, um, which is um, what we do. It, it's it, it's uh, not simple to navigate. This is just one example of a safety data sheet. This is one page out of five. And um, we can analyze basically all the ingredients and, and everything in here. Um, so this is just to give you an idea of it's, it's complex, but um, 
if you look, for example, for certain certifications, so there is one called Declare, which is quite good. The, all the ingredients that are certified by Declare are disclosed. Um, they're basically, they don't test for all the six classes. That's the thing. So we will have to check what, you know, but for one product to at least have a Declare certification, it's already a good thing because you won't have all the, all the chemicals. Then there is something called Cradle to Cradle, um, which is also good, not as comprehensive as Declare. Um, and Cradle to Cradle is mainly for basically products that go back to the earth. So they're made of natural materials. So when they, they are not in use anymore, they can actually um, go back to the ore and they're bio biodegradable. So this is usually also good certification. Building green is for appliances, for example, specific. Then there is Green Guard, which is the most used. Green Guard Gold is the best. Um, and it tests only for certain chemicals, but again, better than nothing. Um, so if something, if you have to choose between a product with Green Guard Gold and nothing, then definitely choose Green Guard Gold. And this can be, for example, for fabrics, for furniture, for flooring, for adhesives and glues, a lot of things. Um, then there is one called the Made Safe certification, which is it tests the whole production. For example, one product that have Made Safe, not many do, because also, you know, for manufacturer, it's expensive to get certified. It's an expense. Um, like I'm sure. I'm sure, I mean, I don't know. I guess most of you know the avocado mattress. It's certified as made safe. It's completely natural and great from the beginning production until the assembly, transportation, packaging, everything. So that's an example. And then you have the one specifics for mattresses and latex, um, goats and goals. If a mattress has these certifications, it's great. So for sure if you're looking to buy a new one. And then uh, we have Faros. This is what we use. It's a bit complex for like anyone to navigate because this is what we look at for specific chemicals. So when a product has all of these certifications, but still there are other chemicals that we don't know what they are, we go into Faros and we check exactly what are the chemicals, where do they come from, um, what is the scientific research uh, that has been made on these chemicals uh, to actually um, see what are the health effects? Uh, because with this amount of chemicals, we cannot know all of them and what they do. And plus, when they come together and they bind together, they have different effects. And the last one is the FSC, which is Forest Management Certification. This is for wood products. So this is there is a lot of noise around this certification in the past years. It's a great one because what it does, it means that the wood that you buy, it's been sourced by a, a forest that is responsible about, you know, trees. So what they do, they replant the trees and they make sure that what it's taken from the earth is given back. Mm -hmm. So this is great, but it doesn't account. It, they don't know what happens after to the wood. Like I can buy this wood and then I can treat it with, um, a toxic sealant and, and then it's, you know, okay, it's a great action for the environment, but then from a health perspective, we, we really don't know what happens after. Um, so this is to give a little of, um, of, yeah, general on the certifications and to finalize really, um, it's important to understand because there is a lot of confusion between sustainable and healthy, a lot of greenwashing in the market. So a sustainable products does not mean that is healthy for us. As an example, recycled carpets, uh, they contain toxic chemicals, which, you know, it's great to recycle, but maybe, you know, they can use these for other spaces, not for homes for example. So you need to think of what is the usage of the product. Am I going to be in touch with it a lot? Um, so when it comes to products that are generally healthy for humans, they're always healthy for the planet as well. <laughs> so as an example is natural paint with natural pigments. So just be aware that when you buy a sustainable product, you're, it, it doesn't mean that you're buying something healthy. 
that's all. You're just, you know, it's a good act for the for the environment, um, for sure. <laughs> and um, a little touch on the air purifiers because it's a big, big thing, um, especially in Dubai because our air here is really not ideal. And this, for air purifiers, just to um, clarify that there are mainly few things to be aware of. And these information are generally not available on the company's websites and, or, you know, when you want to buy something in a shop, no one will ever know this generally. So you have to dig and email them and call and ask the questions. So first of all, it's important to understand what is the delivery rate of the air purifier? Because if an air purifier um, cleans the air, but it's very slow in cleaning, then it you wouldn't have enough time to release clean air. Um, and the room will take too long to become clean. And if you have AC especially running, then it's absolutely not making sense. So it needs to have a, a good flow rate of air. And then very important is the MERV parameter, which is the efficiency number. So how much does it actually clean? Um, uh, what type of particles? Because the particles that we really care about are the smallest one, because it is the one that get into our lungs and respiratory issues. So um, particles that are 0 0.003 microns, 0 0.01 microns, these are the ones that we want to purify uh, beside the others, of course. So ideally, you should have um, a 16 rating of MERV, if it's a 1 to 16 system rating or 20, 19, 20 in the 1 to 20 system. These are different MERV uh, ratings. So this is the system that um, basically assess the efficiency of the filtrations. Now, what to absolutely avoid. Um, so there is, there is always new products in the market that come up with new ideas and strategies that say, oh, we transform the air. So we don't purify, but we transform it. What they claim is that they basically take the chemicals of, of the air that are attached to the dust particles and they break them. But then what happens when you break them, you actually create other <laughs> combinations of chemicals because then the chemicals come back together and then you don't know what's the effect of that. So definitely nothing that transform the air and avoid anything with ozone or UV light in purifiers because ozone um, depletes ox oxygen in the room. And again, it binds with chemicals and particulates in the dust and they create unhealthy air if it's a lot of ozone. And UV light also um, doesn't really remove mold spores or small particles because it cannot simply penetrate and it does not remove the dead bodies of these bacteria or whatever it kills. They stay anyway in the air. So these are some guidelines. Um, I recommend always one or two air purifiers that are very good. Um, any other, when I get asked, um, I check them and um, yeah, I, it takes some time, but then you get to the bottom of it. And, but these two are, are two that I know they're absolutely great. So there's one that's the air doctor. The other one is that IQ air or intelligent. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's the IQ, IQ air. Yeah. Um, and the IQ air is available here. The air doctor needs to be shipped. Uh, um, by the way, the, I, the air doctor, I believe it has ozone. Yes, it has, it has, it has ozone, but you can turn it off. Oh, yeah. Their air purification is so good. The air doctor, the price is so good. Yeah. So good. And you cannot, you don't have to use the ozone um, thing. That's why is because again, it's about the price ranges. The IQ air comes with a higher cost. <laughs> it's quite an investment. Yeah. Um, especially if you have, different rooms. Um, the Air Doctor is a much better price range, very good filtration, and you can just yeah. remove this ozone. So it's uh, it's great. Um, and again, another thing about the ozone, just to clarify, um, ozone 
it's not great when is in high um, high uh, levels, let's say. So if you have a little bit of ozone going into the air, that is, is fine. It's not going to kill anyone. It's not going to deplete the air as much or the oxygen as much. The problem are the machines or the purification system that work only on ozone and ozonizers that, that you know, they completely emit a huge amount of that. And that is really not good. So that's what... Um, and in the bedroom, um, in the bedroom, generally, I mean, as we've seen, for example, paint on the walls um, emit solvents and VOCs, synthetic carpets um, and blankets, furniture, mattresses, the glue that you don't see that is below the flooring or below these, you know, under this skirting that is installed on the walls. Um, so there is uh, fire retardants again, chemicals in the phosphorus, there's a lot of factors and exposure in the bedroom. And just by, you know, questioning and looking at certifications and um, just deciding at least what you want to avoid, then there is a lot of improvements that definitely can Question. be. Yeah. With these things, I mean, when you buy things that are new, yes, you know, it has that new smell. You can, you can tell that there's yeah. volatile organic compounds. If you wash them and aerate them outside, how much of a decrease of exposure are you getting approximately? Does it eventually go away with time? Um, no, it, I mean, it, it doesn't go away fully, um, but it definitely decreases by time. Um, so by washing and putting it in the air, definitely it decreases, but it's... Um, the, the problem with these uh, synthetic materials, it's also not only the emission of these chemicals, but it's also the fact that they affect the air quality. So right. even when they emit less, they're still synthetic and they still create static electricity, which affects the air quality. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important to have as much as possible natural and organic interior materials, sheets and everything, because you improve the air by not having synthetic materials. And um, when you improve the air quality, you get less particles and particulates and dust that is attracted to your environment. Mm -hmm. So it's all like a, a, a circle, like it's uh, basically synthetic uh, materials. They can emit toxins. And, and chemicals in the air, but they also create static electricity that attracts dust and particulates mm -hmm. from outside and they keep the air very electric and everything stagnates there. So it's kind of like a, um, a vicious of, cycle. Of, yeah, exactly. So ideal minimize as much as possible any anything with, uh, with synthetic materials. And um, yeah, so the I mean, I, I really hope that I'm I'm aware it's a lot of information. Um, and there are some links at the end. And I hope that you find this useful and it can help you navigate a bit more when you buy something for your house. Maybe you think about it twice and question a bit more. And when it comes to EMF, uh, also very important to mitigate and reduce exposure as much as possible uh, to improve health and sleep. Because um, at the end of the day, um, you know, we are nature, we resonate, we are well when we are in resonance with natural frequencies. And when we deplete our environment, we completely disconnect from these frequencies and um, and we just start feeling ill, tired, don't sleep well. As you can see, our, our body has the same shape and forms of a leaf close up or the Amazon river network. Everything, we all run electricity. We are all wired in the same way, nature, humans, animals, trees. Um, and any disruptor with that, it just decreases our health and well-being. And I know you, Bernadette, always talk about grounding because that is very important. Um, it's uh, it's that concept to try to keep that connection and that you know, um, yeah, that that connection with with natural frequencies with nature. 
and now nowadays it's not easy. These are some helpful links as well. Um, some information about General Global Wellness Institute, um, uh, EMF Building Biology, Environmental Health Trust. These are trusted EMF shielding um, suppliers because there are some that, uh, again, there's a lot of marketing out there, a lot of Chinese products too. Um, and um, you can maybe, you know, if you want to buy small gadgets for EMF protection for phones and stuff, you can check this website. This is mainly for uh, home shielding, which again, I, I don't really recommend uh, unless you do a, a checkup of the house. But it's just to give you an idea of what's out there. These are some uh, very nice books. The second one is really interesting. The first one is a bit, the body latch is a bit more technical. Um, and then I'll send uh, I'll send you Bernadette the links to wire stuff and all the yeah, adapters. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, and yeah, that's all. Thank you so much. That was amazing. That was um, very detailed and comprehensive. Does anybody have any questions before we end today's session? No question. Uh, thank you so much, Valentina. So Sorry. Thanks a lot. Sorry. Great. Thank, thank, thank you, you so much, Valentina. Thank you so much, Bernadette. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time, uh, Valentina. I will wait for those links and we'll add the um, we'll add that to the session recording for those who aren't yes. here live. And um, there are your details as well. If anybody would like to get in touch with Valentina to do a home assessment, I know that you do home assessments as well for EMF and for mold as well. You can yeah. check moisture and things like that. So uh, do check yeah, out. Yeah, which is website. something we, we didn't touch on, but there's so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can dedicate another another talk to mold. <laughs> yeah, honestly. But no, I think this is, I hope at least it helps people to, make more informed decisions yeah, absolutely. and you know i love that slide things. that you shared with the certifications it's all about empowering you know being able to yeah. know yourself when you go to the stores when you go to buy things what should you be looking for what are the questions to ask so it's very empowering so i appreciate that um, and i want to thank you for your time thank, thank you for being here with us i really appreciate it Thank you very much. Have a nice evening or a good night or Thank good you. morning. <laughs> bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs> bye. Bye-bye. Bye. bye. bye.